The following has been recorded at Cairn University. Any reproduction of this recording without the express permission of the university is prohibited. It is indeed a pleasure for me to introduce the commencement speaker this year. From time to time, we have the opportunity to introduce one of our own. It's a special blessing to our community. Dr. Lloyd Gustoso, who is speaking this morning, has been leading the social work department, now the School of Social Work at Cairn University since 1999. He's a graduate of the institution, holds master's and doctoral degrees from University of Pennsylvania. He has served as a social work professional and a social work educator for all of his adult life. Lloyd is joined here this morning by his wife Amy and their two children, Zoe and Elijah and by his parents. Thank you for being here. There are a lot of things that I could say about Lloyd since I've known him a long, long time. But I do like to tell one story in particular. In the late 90s, when uh, I was uh, associate dean, and we received word that Bill Tarr, who had been leading that department, was going to be leaving us, the uh, gentlemen who were in charge of academics at the time, who most of you will know, Dr. John Master, Dr. Robert Wanger, and Dr. Robert Kilgore, and I were sitting in a room and they said, uh, now what do we do? Because that's a very difficult position to fill at a school like this with our commitments to be committed to professional excellence in the field of social work and holding firm our core beliefs in scripture and the gospel. It's a very difficult task to carry out, to lead that department, to navigate those waters. And they said, what will we do? And my response was, there's only one person to talk to, Lloyd Gustoso. The problem is that Lloyd was employed in the city of Philadelphia. So almost 22 years ago, he's been with us 20 years, almost 22 years ago, I began to work on Lloyd to help him understand that it was God's will for him to join Cairn University. <laughs> And I remember meeting Lloyd on the streets of Philadelphia. We were walking, uh, I was studying at Temple University and he was working in the city. We were walking down the street and this is really how it goes with Lloyd. <clears throat> we crossed one intersection and a doctor from one of the local hospitals, knew Lloyd by name, greeted him and they entered into a conversation. We crossed another intersection and a homeless person recognized Lloyd by name and we had a conversation with them. And that's when I knew that this was the person to lead <clears throat> social work at Cairn University. Lloyd is a friend and a colleague. He has invested in the lives of his students for 20 years in the way that he was invested in by Bill Tarr and Bill Tarr by Dr. Furness before him. Yesterday at the commencement brunch, one of the graduates who shared their thoughts from the social work department said this, she did not want to be a Christian and a social worker, but a Christian social worker. We've been doing that for more than 50 years, and that tradition is alive and well under Lloyd's leadership. These are exciting days as we explore. We're now in the phase of raising money to explore and to launch a master's in social work degree, and uh, ask you to pray for that and to pray for Lloyd and for the students uh, that have been taught over the decades here to go and serve Christ in this field where the needs are so great. But the other thing about Lloyd is, regardless and without further consideration of his own professional bent, he is an exemplar of the mission of the institution, not just as a professional social worker, but as a servant of Jesus Christ who loves his Lord and the Word. Please give a warm Cairn University welcome to our own Lloyd Gustoso. Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, our Lord and Savior, we thank you for this day of commencement. Board of Trustees, President Dr. Williams, Provost Van Billiard, colleagues, friends and family, and most especially the graduating class of 2019, greetings and congratulations. We all come to this day from different paths and facing our own struggles. 
None of us would be here without special people. Your family, your friends, your support team, you know who they are. Let's give them thanks. I myself would not be here without my family. Dr. Williams introduced them. But let me be honest. 27 years ago, I was here at commencement, just like you are now, and I still have no authority or accomplishment that has given me the right to stand before you. I'm severely imperfect. I am only here by the saving grace of God. When my illiterate grandmother was squatting, washing the clothing of missionaries in the Philippines, not with a washing machine, but with rocks by a stream, she heard the gospel for the first time. The Holy Spirit worked within her and she realized her brokenness and separation from God and surrendered herself to the work of Jesus on the cross. God's grace was sufficient then and continues to be. When my family legally immigrated into the United States in the late 1960s, Philadelphia was in crisis. There were hospitals like Mercy Douglas Hospital in southwest Philadelphia, where in black neighborhoods, where black, in, in a black neighborhood, then they could not attract any American doctors to staff them. This is why my parents were recruited, to provide medical care to that neglected neighborhood in southwest Philadelphia. My parents went from a remote part of the Philippines, where they only saw Caucasian missionaries, to the heart of an African-American community in Philadelphia. My parents entered a divided America. They had hopes to start a family, and it wasn't until 1969 that God allowed my life to begin. That journey was not an easy one, as my birth process was filled with fear and doubt. This resulted in me being x-rayed in the womb six times to ensure my safety. This began a journey for me of fear and doubt. As an only child of immigrants, I did not excel academically. In fact, my kindergarten teacher proclaimed to my recently immigrated mother that I was disabled and would never finish high school. My learning style was not valued in school and was not measured or recognized. I remember dreaming that someday I might go to college, but my pattern of Ds and Fs pushed that out of the realm of possibilities. Yet the challenges forced me to cling to the one person that really matters. I remember pleading with Jesus and continue to plead for help through every step of my life. This process of fearing and depending on Christ allowed me to witness the grace of God in my life. I barely made it out of high school and clinging to Jesus as my only hope. Cairn University was gracious to give me a chance in college. The struggles continued until God finally allowed me to discover that I was given a gift to love and learn from people, and that was never valued before. My desire to love others, counsel them, and advocate for those who are overlooked was how I lived my life. And in my search, I discovered what I had been doing my entire life had a name. It was called social work. Discovering social work enabled me to take my God-given talents and refine them within a profession that would allow me to live out the commands of God as my vocation. Thankful for purpose and direction, I sought to live out my life to serve those who are in the most need. God led my path first to children in foster care and later to veterans who were injection drug users. Some of those veterans confided in me that it was difficult working with me because they had been trained to kill people 
that looked just like me. From there, I met my first HIV AIDS patients. The standard response from Christians at that time was, why would you help those people? They don't deserve to be helped. People for thousands of years have been determining who is worthy and unworthy of help. We are so quick to forget that none of us have any standing with God if, if, if it wasn't for Jesus. None of us is worthy of help if it wasn't for Christ. Ultimately, we are not here because of ourselves. In fact, this graduation would not be happening without him. Today and every day is all about God and his son, Jesus. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah. Can I get a praise the Lord? God, in his grace and mercy, has allowed us to prosper in this moment. You are graduating as some of the most gifted, biblically literate, and empowered of this generation. Who empowers you? Almighty God. There are some challenges, though, graduating from Karen. Sometimes you think you figured God out. Sometimes you think you really know the Bible. You think you know God, but when you think about Matthew 7, does he really know you? Does he really know you? God demands honest, vulnerable submission and repentance. He wants to know your heart. If you remember from Matthew 7, Jesus talks about people who are doing works in his name, and he does not know them. I was having a conversation with a leader at SIM, a mission in Charlotte, and my dear friend there, Randy Fairman, was saying, I'm working so hard for God to know me. I want him to know me. He takes walks, telling God everything. He wants God to hear his heart, hear his pain. Graduates, your families and friends, have God know you. Share your heart with him. This is my fear as I go through these points. Do you acknowledge your machines, your phones, more than you acknowledge God? We care about our machines more than we care about each other. Live your life looking up. Have you noticed walking around? People don't look at you anymore. They're looking down. Looking down, you're often just thinking of your own agenda and yourself. We confide more in our phones than in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Children soothe themselves. They try to keep from crying. We want them to soothe themselves independently. But I find that children and adults now soothe themselves through their phones. We don't turn to God for soothing. We need to love every person that crosses our path. We're only here by grace. But will you be looking down as you pass them? How do you love someone if you don't even see them? Number two, there are forces that seek to divide us. As you graduate, you have a choice to perpetuate this divide or make choices that reflect treating others as more important than yourself. We are divided within the church. We have a chance to know and learn from the whole body. 
And often we're just content to know the elbow. We know the elbow really well when the whole body is just a few relationships away. It means we have to set aside our own preferences and ask God to help us love and respect and accept each other. I'm talking about a radical love from God. I pray that we might find more unity in Christ, that our citizenship with Him may mean more than any of our differences. Sometimes following Jesus means making choices that go against our self-interest. God empowers us, and God is in control. As you heard from the scripture reading, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not at your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I know you are highly regarded and decorated today, but God commands us to have humility of mind. Nobody likes to know it all. There will be a temptation to make all your decisions as you graduate based on your self-interest, on what most benefits you, on where the lower taxes are. This is not the way of Jesus. How to spend your time, how you spend your time matters. If it takes away from God or loving your neighbor, it is probably not worthy of your life investment. When we see suffering, do we just thank God that it wasn't us? Or are we supposed to do something about that suffering? We fall into our old flesh when we rely on our own instincts and not on a Christ-led approach of loving and learning from others. Serve the most challenging community God grants you the courage to serve. Number four, our relationship building approach assumes that there must be sameness for there to be a real connection. In other words, we must we assume we need things in common. If you want to make a friend, you need to have some things in common. This is false. Valuing differences and learning to value each other across our differences is the way of Jesus. We should seek to make harmony with others rather than just gathering together and playing one note. Each of us plays different notes and they harmonize. In our relationship building, we can ask, when we work with others, what's it like to be you? My mentor at UPenn, Professor Carter, would always tell us, have you asked your client, what's it like to be you? And genuinely want to hear an answer. The president of Lakeside Educational Network, Jerry Vassar, always says to people, what happened in your life? I really want to learn from you and hear your story. We can learn from others and build authentic relationships across our differences. I pray as you graduate, you might pursue friendships and relationships in a different way. Number five, are you too good or proud to ask for help? Are you too good or proud to talk to God? We spend a lot of time in social work helping students understand the profound effort it takes for some people to ask for help. We're Americans. We don't need anybody's help. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which, of you, which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts, give good things to those who ask him? But we're often too afraid to ask. Or maybe we have too much pride. 
God perfects us in his love, and his perfect love casts out our fear. God always does his will in a way different than what we think. We think we're so smart, and yet God does things in a way that really glorifies him. You may be someone here thinking, what is this all about? What do you mean ask? Well, if you're here and you don't understand a relationship with Jesus, I want to take a moment to let you know that you can ask God. If you're not sure of what this is all about and who Jesus is and how he gives us direction for eternity, I pray that you might get to the point where you can see that your life is inadequate because of sin and you're separated from God. And you have an opportunity to ask God to show you and to surrender your life to Jesus and his work that he did on the cross in dying for us. You in this moment can say a prayer in your head and submit to Jesus and rely on him alone for your life. It is not too late. Blessed are those who hungry and thirst for, right, for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You have worked hard. You have faced impossible odds. You have made choices that sometimes only benefit you, but God still has your back. God has your back spiritually. God still remains, and God has prevailed and will prevail. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Sudan Interior Mission, SIM, began in 1893. Canadians Walter Gowans and Roland Bingham and American Thomas Kent had a vision to evangelize 60 million people in sub-Saharan Africa in 1893. Unable to interest other missions to, to do this work, to pursue people in Africa, the three of them went out alone to do this. Malaria took all three. Gowans and Kent died of a fever in the next year, in 1894, and Bingham returned to Canada. On his second attempt, he caught malaria again and was forced to return home. Unable to return to Africa, Bingham sent out a third team. They successfully established a base 500 miles inland in 1902, and from there the work of SIM in Africa began. Through those efforts, one of the denominations planted by SIM is EQUA, Evangelical Church Winning All. Now, EQUA has 6,000 churches and 10 million members, and much of Africa has heard about Jesus. You, graduates, you're entering into a world with profound, impossible challenges. Every second, 30,000 people are looking at pornography every second. Since 1970, there have been well over 45 million abortions. 11.4 million people misuse prescription opioids. 40.3 million victims of human trafficking. Um, there are 40.3 million victims of human trafficking in the world. It looks impossible. 150 million people are homeless in the world, with 554,000 just in the United States. Are you afraid? Let me remind you, we have already won. Life is too short to live in fear. Fear the Lord, not this life. God's wrath, God's wrath is real. God's love is eternal. God has placed, on us, placed us on earth to glorify him by responding to human needs, by living out the gospel and making Jesus real. People do not believe Jesus is real. 
you have a chance to show them that he is real by how you live your life. Let me remind you what's coming. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Suffering will end. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It's time for you to make bold choices, not choices based in faith in yourself. You're not supposed to have faith in yourself, but faith in Almighty God, who will sustain you no matter what will come. Follow the way of Jesus. Class of 2019, how will you live? Live boldly for Jesus.